epistle for the fourth Sunday after Easter is taken from St. James, chapter 1. Dearly beloved, every best gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no change nor shadow of alteration. For of his own will has he begotten us by the word of truth, that we might be some beginning of his creatures. You know, my dearest brethren, and let every man be swift to listen, but slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man worketh not the justice of God. Wherefore, casting away all immodesty and abundance of, of malice with meekness, Receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. John, chapter 16. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, I go to him that sent me, and none of you ask me, Whither goest thou? But because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is expedient to you that I go. For if I go not, the paraclete will not come to you. But if I go, he will, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convince the world of sin and of justice and of judgment. Of sin, because they believed not in me. And of justice, because I go to the Father and you shall see me no longer. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is already judged. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will teach you all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but what things soever he shall hear, he shall speak. And the things that are to come, he shall show you. He shall glorify me, because he shall receive of mine, and shall show it to you. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. <coughs> By way of announcement, please pray for Father Nicholas Gruner, who died this past week. And uh, he ran, of course, the Fatima Crusader, which influenced so many souls throughout the world. He was a great voice in this age of apostasy, calling to the Pope, calling to the bishops, calling to all Catholics to fulfill the request of Our Lady of Fatima. And the last message of Father Gruner before he died was his conversation with an exorcist priest who said uh, that the chastisement of God upon this world is imminent. So pray for Father Gruner. It is a, it's a mysterious thing. The Society of St. Pius X has been eclipsed in the faith. They have compromised on matters of the faith in the leadership, accepting Vatican II in the light of tradition, accepting the new mass as legitimate, accepting uh, the new code of canon law, which is loaded with heresies. And that is a great punishment on the world when the last flickering torch goes out. And only scattered throughout the world are a few candles of resistance trying to keep the faith. And then when the last voice defending the Mother of God in Fatima, when he goes out, it says in Scripture, God's greatest punishment is to hold back good leaders. In other words, when God gives leaders that lead you to hell, bishops and priests that lead souls to hell, that is the greatest punishment on the earth. And we have been living this greatest punishment since Vatican II, since 1965. So, dear faithful, pray for Father Gruner. Maybe Our Lady has spared him the chastisements to come on this earth. Maybe. Because he did fight nobly. He fought faithfully to the end 
for the honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So pray for him. The seminarians will be going up next week to his funeral and uh, his burial. Also, uh, Dr. Sen Dr. Sunil has been ordained a subdeacon, in case any of you don't know. He was ordained a subdeacon by Bishop Williamson a few weeks ago in England. And uh, he will be ordained a priest and deacon and priest on June 28th of this summer. So pray for uh, the Master of Ceremonies here, Dr. Sunil, who will be ordained a priest this June. Also, um, among the resistance faithful, they have, they have called up a rosary crusade, another one, but this one for Our Lady of Fatima, that the Pope consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Enough nonsense of trying to lift excommunications that don't exist. Enough nonsense of trying to lift a Latin mass abrogation that never existed. That's playing games with Our Lady. But this Rosary Crusade is for the Pope to convert and do his duty, which is to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Until that's done, society and the Church are just going to keep collapsing fast. Our Lady did tell Sister Lucia it would be done, but it would be late. Probably after a few nations have been completely annihilated off the face of the earth. This might be what it takes to wake up these modernist prelates from their Disneyland world of modernism. Sin exists. Hell exists. Christ really died on the, Christ, on the cross. Christ is God. There is no other. And modernism has brought this soup of nonsense that all religions are nice, that the state can be neutral on matters of religion, that uh, everybody goes to heaven. That's simply not true. So pray, pray every day the rosary. On May 13th we'll begin this crusade. And then finally, um, after the mass, there'll be a catechism for everybody. I, I want you all there. Uh, down at the priest's house with the coffee and donuts. And the catechism class is not that formal. You can bring your coffee, bring donuts, but uh, just listen. It'll be at about 10 minutes after Mass, 10, 15 minutes or so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. The Orthodox... That is, the systematic orthodox that broke away from the church in 1054 under Bishop Michael Chelarius. <coughs> that schism is built also on heresy. So you know the Russian orthodox, the Ukrainian orthodox, the Greek orthodox. They ref they're built on two or three big heresies. It's not just that they don't recognize the, the Roman pontiff. As Catholics, we recognize and we pray for the Pope, even if he's a bad one, like this one. But the Orthodox, the Schismatics, they refuse the primacy of Peter. And they see the Metropolitan of Moscow, the Metropolitan of Constantinople, and the Metropolitan of Kiev as their popes. And the Virgin Mary of Fatima, she didn't ask for the Metropolitan of Russia to consecrate Russia. Of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She asked that the Pope of Rome consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which tells you that the Virgin Mary, she's showing the world where the true religion is. It's not in these false Orthodox schismatic churches. However, it is true, these Orthodox churches have a mass, have a sacred liturgy that is very beautiful. And it proves to the modernists how the liturgy is very ancient. And from the very beginning, in the first centuries, it was with great solemnity and golden vestments and incense and chant. And they are a rebuke to the, modern, the modernists who say we have to go back to burlap bags and clay chalices and communion in the hand and drinking of the chalice in a table instead of an altar. And Pius XII, as you know, he condemned this nonsense, calling it antiquarianism. But the schismatics also are built on heresy. To refuse the Roman pontiff is a heresy. You cannot, if I deny the primacy of Peter, I'll go straight to hell. Because Christ revealed that. 
he, he chose Peter as the first pope. And then, and then in this gospel, the, the schismatics also, most of them deny the Immaculate Conception because it was declared in 1864, uh, af well after the, the Western schism. So they don't recognize any decisions or saints of the Latin church. Uh, but a big, big heresy that the schismatics hold on to is that the Holy Ghost only proceeds from the Father. But the Catholic doctrine has always been, and it's, it, it reveals this in this Gospel of this Mass, St. John chapter 16, which is actually at the Last Supper. And Christ is saying, he's spilling out his sacred heart. It's his last testament, it's his last words to his, his bishops and his priests before he is crucified. And in this he says, uh, I go to him that sent me. And then he says, I will send you a paraclete. But when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will teach you all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but what things soever he shall hear, he shall speak. And it's always been the Catholic doctrine that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. And in the, in the creed, the choir will very soon chant this when they sing Filioque. Filioque says that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. And St. Thomas Aquinas, when he treats of the question of the Most Blessed Trinity, he raises the question, can the Father be sent, and the Son be sent, and the Holy Ghost be sent? And these are what's called the mission of the Blessed Trinity. There is the life of God within himself, which is the processions within the Blessed Trinity. But God also acts outside himself. And that, the first mission that he sends is the Divine Son. And the second mission, outside of the Blessed Trinity, is the Holy Ghost. But there is what's called the invisible mission of the Blessed Trinity. And this means that God comes to a soul by the state of grace. So when you have a newly baptized baby, which was wrapped by the chains of the devil, and the five exorcisms break those chains, in every baptism there's, there's the five exorcisms, which were dropped by the conciliar sacraments. And then when the priest pours water over the baby's head, or an adult, or even in confession, when he absolves the soul that's been cut off from the life of grace and deserving of eternal damnation, the blood of our Lord washes that soul. But what happens? What happens, what takes place is the Holy Trinity comes into the soul. The Son is invisibly sent. The Holy Ghost is invisibly sent with the Father in the soul. So the soul really becomes a temple of God. It's not just poetry when St. Paul says, don't you know that you are temples of the Holy Ghost and that God dwells in you? This is the doctrine of sanctifying grace which many Catholics will live all their life and not even give two cents of thought worth to realizing the, the beauty of this doctrine of, of our Lord Jesus Christ of the Catholic Church, that a soul really becomes a temple of the Blessed Trinity. And St. Thomas Aquinas says, how do you know the Son is sent into you? He will quote St. Augustine and say, when you, when you perceive good thoughts in your mind, when your mind is instructed towards truth, and your heart is inflamed to the love of God, that is the Son, Christ, the Son, working in your soul with the Father and the Holy Ghost. And the movement of the love of God that God gives to each soul by grace, that movement of the love towards God moved by the Holy Ghost is the presence of the Holy Ghost in the soul. So you have the whole Blessed Trinity who act in your soul. 
Now you might be saying, oh, that's nice talk, Father. It's all up there. But God is not just up there. We are not Freemasons. We are not deists. Ben Franklin was a deist. So was Thomas Jefferson. They refused the Blessed Trinity. They refused the Incarnation. They didn't see and adore Christ as God. That's why they didn't want Christ as God of our country. They didn't want his name on our Constitution. And that's our problem. That's why our country is falling to pieces. The only thing that can rescue our country, our nation, is to put back the name, put for the first time the name of Jesus Christ on our Constitution and his Catholic religion and his heart and the heart of his mother on our flag. That's the only solution. And the, but that's, even that is not enough because you can build a thousand churches. You can make a thousand flags with the heart of Jesus and Mary. But God is not about externals first. He first wants your love and your mind and the respect that he has for each soul. None of you were handcuffed. None of you were handcuffed to come to Mass today. None of you are handcuffed and dragged into the confessional against your will. And none of you are forced to pray. And if you go for a month without prayer, that's a mortal sin, you know. St. Alphonsus says that. To go a month without prayer is a mortal sin, because it's like committing spiritual suicide. You stop breathing. If you stop breathing in ten minutes, you're dead. And breathing to the soul, breathing to the body, is what prayer is to the soul. And if you go a month without prayer, you're dead. But what does our Lord do? Does he, does he punish you? Does he whack you? Does he, he, he does try to knock at your heart. And he might try to, your angel might kick you in the rear. Your angel might knock you off your horse like St. Paul was kicked off his horse and landed in the dust and then he saw Christ. Sometimes our Lord will try to hit hard, whether through a death or sickness or some loss or suffering or having difficulty paying the bills. And that puts us on our knees because we are so proud, we are so forgetful of reality that we live sometimes as if God doesn't exist. And that's why people, always Catholic people always wonder, why do, the, why do the worldly people make all the money? Why do they have everything go easy for them? And we always struggle, and we always have difficulties. And St. Alphonsus, and St. John Vianney, and many of the saints tell us, thank God, thank God when he gives you, gives you crosses and difficulties and, and tears and struggles. Thank God because it puts us on our knees to treat God as God and come before him as we are, beggars before him. Because think of it, if everything goes well, how soon we forget God, how soon we forget his commandments, how soon mass and extra prayers and devotion and confession become a burden when I can have all these other things of the world. And that's why St. Alphonsus says, watch out. When everything goes smooth and well, start praying because there's danger. Because God is just. He will reward everyone, and some will only get their reward in this life. Because everybody does some little bit of good. And God is just. He will reward them in this life but they will suffer eternally in the pains of hell because they did not love God and they died without the state of sanctifying grace. So what is sanctifying grace? It's, it's, this it is fulfilled in the very words of our Lord on the Last Supper. He says these great words, We will come. It's in the plural, notice. We will come. And we'll make our abode, our mansionem in Latin, our mansion, with him. So he's, God is saying, we, the Trinity, will come and live in your soul. And God doesn't want to just live in your soul. Imagine you go visit one of your relatives, and you walk in the house, they let you in the door, they sit you down, and they just totally ignore you. And you're saying, you know, we're cousins. Do you remember me? And they just totally ignore you. And that's how most of us treat 
the Blessed Trinity in our soul. He's our guest, and we can give two pins. But God gave you what the chickens out here don't have, and the dogs and the birds. They cannot know and converse with God. The chickens and the dogs and the cats, they cannot love their God. Although they obey Him perfectly, they do what they're supposed to do. But they cannot love Him. But God gave us intelligence, and He gave us a heart. And this is a reflection of the Blessed Trinity, because the Son is the procession of the Word, the wisdom of the Father. And He's given to us, and He instructs us through spiritual reading. That's why it's so important to, every day, do some spiritual reading, to feed your mind. But also the Holy Ghost in us as well moves you to the love of God. And God wants this, this closeness with each soul. And that's why uh, it's true that children can be the greatest contemplatives. Because they see God, Dad, why does, why does that chicken lay the egg? Why, why is the sun so bright? Why, is the, why do the grasshoppers jump so high? They ask all these questions because they want to know the truth. And the truth is Christ himself who created all things. So God wants this union with us, this intellectual sharing of ideas, of humility, of conversation, of instruction. And then the Holy Ghost and the Father and the Son within the soul move us to love. So God wants a conversation. He wants to live in mansionem in Latin. He wants to live in us like in a mansion, like among friends. And how many Catholics will live their life? And we priests see this so often. It's very sad. People live just totally distracted, giving no time to prayer, no time to contemplation. But you're made for that. You're not animals. But if you listen to the Jewish Masonic advertisers, they'll tell you, yeah, you're an animal. You're a goy, all right. And you must live like one. Just live for material things. You're a dog. Just live like a dog. Eat, sleep, have fun. Reproduce. They're big on that. And basically the media, if you listen to the media, you're just a cow. You're, no lower, you're lower than a cow. And that's why the enemies of Christ, they, they drag man to slavery. Slavery to the passions, slavery to vice and sin. And that's why the modern world is so messed up, because people are slaves to sin. And what does Our Lady of Fatima say? Why will the earth be punished? and whole nations be completely annihilated. That means blown off the face of the earth. Why? Because of sin. And sin separates us from God. Sin is the worst tragedy. But God doesn't want that. He wants you to use your mind to adore Him, to think of Him, to think and see all things in relation to Him. And He wants your heart to love Him. And and we must also see that society, society, the church and state, also have to be working together. The church and state are like mom and dad, says Pope Leo the Thirteenth. If they're divorced, you got a messed up family, and the kids will have a hard time keeping sanity and saving their soul. But mom and dad, if they are married and work together, they're not equal in all things. The father is the head, the mother is the heart of the family. But both must work together to raise their children for heaven. So it is with the church and state. They must work together to, to help people get to heaven. But if the state impedes that and, and smashes the true religion and erases the name of Christ the King and allows all perverse religions, false religions to have equal rights to build their churches and spread their horrible doctrines, what happens? We forget how deadly Protestantism really is. We think it's a nice, friendly church built on the street corner, and all Protestants are nice and love Jesus. It's not true. Protestantism preaches divorce. Protestantism preaches contraception and birth control. And logically, what follows that is abortion. 
Protestantism destroys the family and morals. It is deadly. Paganism, or Muslims, allow polygamy, more than one wife. That's the destruction of the family. When Christ said, uh, a man will marry a woman, and the two become one flesh. The sacredness of marriage, and the only religion that defends the woman and tells the girls, and especially their fathers, make sure your girls dress modestly. Because if they dress like women of ill repute, they're going to be treated like women of Ill, Ill repute. And their whole lives are ruined. So the Catholic Church has been the best defender of our ladies, of our women, because we see in them the, imitate, the, the a little image of the Virgin Mary. And the best protection for a woman is the sacredness, firstly, of the convent, giving their life to God, that's the highest. But the second rank is marriage. And the Church defends the sacred bond of marriage, and condemns divorce. And this is another reason why Vatican II is so poisonous, and, and how religious liberty, that heresy, has, has destroyed our nations. Because it allows all these false religions to come and promote their divorce, contraception, and uh, dissolving of the family, and dissolving even of the human nature. When they allow the Sodom and Gomorrah doctrines you have the anger of God soon following. Now listen, I won't go long, but listen to Archbishop Lefebvre, who gave us this great bishop of the Catholic Church, foretold by the Virgin Mary in 1600s in Ecuador. He gives us the program of, of how we must see things, and how we must rebuild, and especially for the men, what is our goal as Catholics? Do we just live like a cow, make money, and gratify ourselves, and live like God doesn't exist, like the media would have us live? No. We must return to Catholic tradition, Archbishop Lefebvre. In the authority of the Roman pontiff, the power symbolized by the tiara must again be seen. In other words, the Pope has to return to the Catholic doctrine himself, on his papacy. That's a long story, but in, in one nutshell, collegiality brings democracy within the Catholic Church. Christ did not found a democracy. He founded a monarchy in his church. The Pope is head, period. And the New Vatican II doctrine says, oh, he's just one among the bishops. And that's why Paul VI threw off his tiara and put on a bishop's mitre to show he's just one among the buddies. That's false teaching. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre and, and, and those that stand with him defend the papacy. The most loyal sons of the Pope are the traditional Catholics who, have, who oppose collegiality. Archbishop Lefebvre, there must be a permanent tribunal for the defense of the faith and morals. That's how called the Holy Inquisition. We need the Holy Inquisition restored back to the church and not just some advisory board. Bishops must regain their personal powers and sphere of activity and their common problems be solved in proper region. All councils under the authority of the Supreme Shepherd. The day must come for freeing the true apostolic work undertaken in a diocese from all the impediments by which it is paralyzed today. And then he goes on, uh, the glory of God and our Lord, the sanctification of souls by our Lord Jesus Christ, and the truly Christian education must be restored, and teaching given by the priest in religious orders, the restoration of a Catholic social order where the bishop and the priest are given the official status owed to priesthood in every society. So what do you do when you, your bishops and priests are all modernists? Well, we have, to, we have to rebuild with Catholic tradition, even if we're small. Seminaries must be restored to their true function. The, the training of holy priests filled with the faith 
and learning and zeal for the glory of our Lord and the salvation of souls. Once more, there must be the reestablishment of religious orders and congregations, nuns and monks, nurseries of generous and holy <laughs> souls manifesting to the world the presence of the Holy Ghost in the church and in souls by the practice of heroic charity in all spheres and in all countries. Catholic schools and Catholic universities must be restored, regardless of the state programs for the la laicization of Catholic schools. So this must be our goal, to restore the Catholic social order at every level. We need Catholic doctors, Catholic lawyers, Catholic statesmen, <coughs> Catholic uh, carpenters, Catholic plumbers, Catholic computer technicians, Catholic musicians, Catholic artists, but all working for the glory of Christ and the reestablishment of the Catholic social order where Christ is king. Understanding of the true faith and the meaning of Christendom must be given back to the Christian families, putting them on their guard against the temptations of the world. And then he says, societies are third orders, like Dominicans or third order Franciscans, among families bent on being true Catholics in their attitude to a corrupt society must be reorganized. And then he talks about the guilds, personal organization, excuse me, patronal organizations and cooperatives. That is, doctors seem to form in something like doctors' guild, medical guilds, our nursing guilds, our carpenter guilds, our farmers' guilds where our, our youth have something to go to, they can receive training and have some sort of Catholic society and environment to, to be connected with. And this was smashed at the French Revolution. And Pope Leo XIII, we've called for this to be revived, what was called the cooperatives, something like uh, the guilds. Seeking to work together as brothers for the rights and duties of all, and agreeing not to res resort to the social bane of the strike, which is none other than a cold civil war, setting up bodies for consultation and understanding, and as a last resort, egalitarian tribunals for the settlement of disputes should all be supported. And then finally, says Archbishop Lefebvre, the promulgation of civil legislation in accordance with the laws of the church and the nomination of Catholic representatives bent on leading society to official recognition of the kingship of our Lord in society. This must be promoted. A dream. That sounds impossible. How can you talk about the kingship of Christ? This is America. It's the land of the free. Is it the land of the free when over 400,000 babies have been butchered in their mother's womb and their blood flows in our streets, calling to heaven for vengeance? Is this the land of the free? Is this the land of the free where women and men who made vows before God can break their vows and divorce? Is this the land of the free that enslaves our children with lies, evolution, atheism, godlessness, immorality of the most perverse sort shoved down their throats in our public schools, in the media, in our, in our freedom to have pornography everywhere and rock and roll music that promotes immorality? Is this freedom that we have become a nation of the worst sort of slavery. Such slavery has not been seen since before the flood of Noah. And we, we believe we're the land of the free and the home of the brave. Sorry. There are brave souls out there, and this is what Our Lady wants out of you. You few, stand up. And you few men that are left, stand up and defend the truth. Defend the faith and put your goal, what really counts, to reestablish the kingship of Christ. And it starts where first? It's not going to start in our White House first, that's for sure. It's not going to start in our legislative Supreme Court decisions in Congress, that's for sure. It's got to start somewhere, though, and it starts first in our soul. When Christ lives and reigns in the soul by sanctifying grace, where he is loved and adored as our God and your best friend and your spouse, there you can start rebuilding. 
we got to convert ourselves first and then our families. And your families should be sanctuaries of virtue, holiness, forgiveness, joyful service of God, of living out his commandments and being a light for other families and lost souls and stray sheep and stray dogs out there, poor kids from divorced homes. They turn to families that are united and, and show a joyful Catholic life. They're drawn to that. And what really draws a lot of people is our ladies, believe it or not, the Catholic girls. There is a beauty about the Catholic girls that the modern world wants to destroy. Firstly, virginity. Secondly, purity. Thirdly, that they even dress like a girl. The modern world wants to drag our ladies into the mud, put them on pants, put them chewing tobacco in their mouth, and have them cuss like tr truck drivers. And that's not a woman. That's the media <coughs> defilement of women. And turn her into a thing to be used. That's the media. Pornography destroys the woman, destroys the men's minds. So <coughs> we've got to start living in the, always in the state of grace, frequent confession. We all need that. The, the cleric's got to go at least every week. <coughs> Clergy got to go every week and nuns to confession. Keep their souls pure before God. And it keeps us it keeps us face to face with reality. We don't get false illusions when we go to confession that I'm all that great and I'm all that holy and I'm all that good. Confession reminds us we're poor sinners and I gotta confess and I gotta work to save my soul and I'm not better than my neighbor. In fact, they might have more graces than I do. And they might go to heaven before I do. So we cannot really judge our neighbor's soul. Even if you see people living in sin, we got to be careful because that could be me in a few years. So we got to pray for them, and, and as St. Paul says, judge the better of our neighbor and, and uh, treat others as our superior, in a way. In a way. And uh, our families, and then <coughs> at this point of the war, the Virgin Mary is the only one that can really save us now. <coughs> and God wills this to be impressed deeply in our minds. And with the passing of Father Gruner, is there going to be a voice anymore to, to tell the Pope, consecrate Russia? Are there going to be voices anymore rising up to their bishops and uh, to pray the rosary and families to, fam to pray the rosary and the five first Saturdays and the nine first Fridays? Father Gruner did a great work. And he reached many, many, many souls. And with his passing and the eclipse of the faith in the, in the last bastion of tradition, the SSPX, we are seeing that our only rescue is the Mother of God. So double your rosaries. Wear your brown scapular. And fulfill what Our Lady asked. Do penance for this for the for the chastisements that are going to hit us soon, and pray. Really convert our souls to God, and let's ask the Mother of God in this Holy Mass. She is the one. She is. Yesterday there was a big boxing match. I think it was yesterday. Or is it next week? Yesterday I don't know who won, but it was a big boxing match between two big names. But imagine Mike Tyson or one of these big boxers stepping into the ring and being beat up by, by little Michaela here. How old are you, Michaela? Six? She's six. And she just smacks him and steps on his head and crushes his head. That's the role of Our Lady. She is going up against the powers of hell, the, dra the dragon himself, and has given to her this sweet, loving, tender Virgin Mary. She's going to smack that huge dragon, and she's going to crush his head and crush out his brains and his crack his skull and squeeze out his blood. That is her great role, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And God wants this. He wants to extol his mother by choosing the most weak of the sexes, the most frail and beautiful, delicate lily, and use this to crush the proud heads of the dragon. So stay close to the Virgin Mary. 
her victory is, is, is coming. It's coming. And prepare it yourselves by living always in the state of grace, deepening the love of God and conversation with God by prayer and daily rosary and spiritual reading and running with all your heart and strength to the heavenly trophy. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin.